Yep. Um, welcome everyone to another session of the data learning seminars. Today we have um, Dr. Marie-Lou Gabriel. She did her PhD in Paris. Now she's currently working as a postdoc in NYU. And soon she'll take a position in the Cold Polytechnic in France. So Marie-Lou, um, I'll leave the audience with you, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and giving me uh, the opportunity of uh, presenting this research uh, to you guys. I, what I will talk to you about today is something that is at the interface between Monte Carlo methods and learning. And I will tell you more precisely how we can try to accelerate sampling algorithms using uh, a specific type of generative models that are called normalizing flows. So uh, this is going to be a, a work, I mean, based on joint works with Grant Roscoff in Stanford and Eric van den Eyden at the current institute here at uh, NYU. I'm very happy to take questions during the, the, the talk, so don't, don't hesitate to, uh, to interrupt me whenever uh, you feel that you need to ask something. That will be really great. And yeah, without further ado, uh, let me uh, start telling you more about the topic of today. So uh, the context is uh, high dimensional probabilistic models uh, and those we can find in many different situations. They may come out of some Bayesian statistics we are trying to do, some Bayesian models. For example, here I have a graph that is predicting the quality of the water in a lake, depending on many different factors. And looking at, at the problem statistically, we can build posterior distributions that may be very high dimensional, or it can also come from just studying nature and uh, taking the statistical mechanics point of view, where we are going to describe, for example, the distribution of molecules configurations, such as in these small alanide peptides, uh, with a Boltzmann distribution. So we will have a distribution over uh, maybe the coordinates of the different atoms that are going to uh, give a molecular distribution. So those are two examples, but uh, there can be many, many more situations in which um, we need to make sense of those high dimensional distributions. And uh, what I'm going to use as a notation for the random variable uh, we are interested in is going to be x throughout the talk, and it will live in uh, a dimension d. And then uh, if most of the time uh, making any computation with, with uh, respect to this random variable, uh, uh, computing expectation is going to be intractable. And uh, the method of choice then is to use Monte Carlo methods to approximate those expectations, right? So replace the integral by the sum of the samples that we obtain from the high dimensional distribution. So within Monte, uh, within, uh, Monte Carlo methods uh, in high dimension, one of the most popular method is to build a uh, Markov chains uh, that is going to, that I could characterize as the following for a quick uh, summary that uh, as a starting point one has a density so this row of x and uh, typically you don't know the normalization so you think that you only know exponential minus u if you're using this uh, uh, statistical mechanics uh, formulation and then one way to construct uh, uh, samples that are going to be distributed according to this unnormalized density is uh, to use the metropolis Hastings algorithm, which in a few words uh, is, goes as follow. First, you initialize uh, at uh, some uh, coordinates, uh, I mean, some value of the random variable x0. And then you are going to construct a chain where you propose to update the random variable uh, to a position xt plus one from xt, and you accept or reject according to uh, the metropolis Hastings criterion that is going to compare the value of the target density at the jumped position and the value at uh, the original position and uh, the probability of proposing such a jump. And if uh, you have that uh, the chain you are con uh, constructing in this manner is uh, ergodic and uh, that it can reach all the interesting uh, 
places, I mean, in the in the space where your dimensional, where your random variable is defined, um, and that it's at aperiodic, then you will find that this metropolis is in criteria enforce detailed balance, which will then ensure that you converge indeed to uh, the target distribution. So okay, so that was just a quick reminder of uh, of those uh, typical Markov chains uh, one is using to compute a high uh, to sample from a high dimensional distribution. Now uh, we should observe that most of the time what we are going to be using is local moves. So meaning that if we start at uh, some given um, configuration of this molecule, we are only going to perturb it a bit and see if we accept or not. And the reason for using those small perturbations, so those local move uh, in the Markov chain is because then we will get a good acceptance. If we are close to a likely uh, configuration and we just perturb the bits, we are more uh, likely to generate um, another likely configuration that we will uh, accept. However, the problem of the strategy, of course, is that if we have uh, energy barriers, such as it's the case for this uh, two com uh, conformations of, of the small protein, then uh, we have an exponential time that is going to be needed to equilibrate in between modes. And so we will need uh, an infinite amount of computes in order uh, to get to the actual solution. So uh, what's a solution to that is to use instead uh, non-local moves. Uh, and there are lots of, of attempts in the literature to try to come up with smart non-local move, but uh, it's a problem that is uh, incredibly hard. It's hard to design a way of finding where to jump uh, that is not somewhere nearby. And so it's it's uh, the, the whole problem is that you generally get bad acceptance unless you have really a lot of information about the problem and, and custom design uh, the job. Okay, so the question now was, well, can neural network that we know are becoming um, more and more useful in those high dimensional problems in general, uh, learn precisely uh, to help in this in this uh, setting. So propose non-local MCMC moves. So Monte Carlo Markov chain moves. And there has been a lot of, of uh, work uh, over the past two, three years that I've started to look at this problem. Uh, for example, uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo HMC is one very popular method that is uh, local, but not too local. I mean, that is already trying uh, to uh, have as much of a span as possible. Uh, well, some authors propose that we actually learn an Hamiltonian for running this HMC that is going to uh, uh, lead us to even more decorrelation of the Markov chains. Uh, and some other authors have uh, investigating using directly deep generative models that I will uh, uh, describe uh, in the next slide a bit more in depth, where so has to really use a high dimensional distribution to uh, learn the transition operator or to model the target density directly. And this is going to be uh, the focus of this talk. So we are placing ourselves uh, among those works. Okay, so why does it make sense to use deep generative models uh, in MCMC? Well, let me first remind you about what's uh, the, the basics of a deep generative model. The idea is to learn a transformation that I'm going in T uh, and uh, that has parameter theta, typically a deep neural network, such that if we sample from a base distribution uh, that is simple, uh, think a high, a high dimensional Gaussian, then by transforming the random variable, so here Z through uh, the map T, uh, we get X uh, that is uh, going to be uh, so sampled from this so-called push forward distribution. And that is going to be much more complicated than Z, than Z sorry. So for instance, we could transform a white Gaussian noise into the image of a dog. And importantly, what those deep generative models are, are able to do uh, is that they are able to, okay, create those very uh, highly structured samples from non-structured simple uh, 
uh, to sample distribution uh, random variables, but they are also giving us the opportunity to uh, create of those uh, complicated distribution independent samples because every time that we are going to uh, sample a new value for the base uh, random variable, we are going to get a new uh, x, which can be so uh, at, uh, the sample from a much more complicated distribution. So then what's the idea in combining a deep generative model and an, and, and an MCMC? Well, is given that we have a, a target uh, that now I'm going to define by row star. Uh, so this is the distribution that we only know uh, the unnormalized density of and that we wish to acquire samples from. We are going to use a deep generative model to propose mo uh, uh, a jump in the Metropolis Hastings uh, MCMC. And then we are going to accept reject according to, to uh, the usual criteria. And, but you can see that uh, there are different things that in order to uh, make this program doable, we need to pay attention to. There is the fact uh, that we need to be able to sample and evaluate the push forward. So we need to be able to uh, compute this row theta of XT that comes from the parametrization with a deep generative model. And we need to be able to sample. And not all uh, deep generative model in the literature will offer this possibility, but we will see that with normalizing flow, this is possible. Two, we also need to uh, make, I mean, to be, to be careful about the fact that we are going to have an ergodic chain. So that the proposal is going to consider all the state space and not going to focus only out on a sub part of the state space. So that's another thing we need to pay attention to and that will have some regard with the learning of uh, the deep generative model we are using in, uh, in the MCMC. And finally, we always need to worry about whether or not we have good acceptance, right? Because that's uh, what is usually uh, the big issue in, in running those multi, uh, MCMC moves that are non-local. So, uh, so let's see. So as I was uh, first hinting at, uh, we have that we are going to be very strict about which kind of deep generative model we are using in order uh, to um, be able to incorporate the gen deep generative model in an MCMC. And we are going to use normalizing flows, which are invertible networks with Jacobian that are easy to compute. So in this case, if we have an invertible network, what we can have is that we are going to have a closed form expression for the push forward distribution that will be, uh, that will be given by this change of variable formula. So we have that rho theta of x, so the, the density that the model is assigning to uh, the value x of the random variable that is given by the base distribution density. So think maybe a Gaussian distribution density evaluated at the inverse of the map uh, on x. So we had uh, z that was transformed, z that was transformed into x. Then we need to go back to the what we call the Latin space, uh, the space in which Z is living in order to evaluate this, this base distribution. And then we have uh, the determinant of the Jacobian. So, okay, that's, that's the theory. So if we have an invertible network, then we'll be able to have an expression for uh, this density. And uh, now how do we build neural network architectures that are invertible and for which we are going to be able to compute this Jacobian? Well, one solution is to use those coupling layers that were introduced uh, for real NVP uh, architecture of which I'm giving here the, the reference. And how are those uh, layers made? Well, they are made in the following manner. If you are trying to build a layer, so going from X to the next, to the next stage that I'm calling Y, what you're gonna do is that you're gonna split your uh, uh, vector, your random variables. So let's say that it has dimension D. 
you're going to take half of the dimensions and call it x1 and half of the dimension and call them x2. So you have those, you're seeing your random variable as a split of two random variables. And then you are going to keep one part unchanged. So y2 is going to be equal to x2. And using the part you haven't changed to parameterize an affine transformation of the first part. So here you should think of S theta, that is a scaling factor, and T theta, that is a translation factor, as uh, neural networks that are outputting the values so of this translation of the scaling as a function of the values of X2. And if you are doing that, uh, you will see that it's very easy to invert such a layer because you know that, well, X2 was, on, was just Y2. And if you know the value of X2 and Y2, which is the same, you can invert the affine transformation that was transforming X1. So you have those affine transformation that are going to parameterize actually something that is nonlinear because you are having the, the values of the coefficients that actually depend on the value of the random variable, and that is going to be easily invertible. And if you uh, do the math, you also realize that uh, the Jacobian is block diagonal uh, with uh, a, a value that is very easy to compute and uh, will take linear time uh, to obtain. So those are very uh, neat layers. But something that what one might be worried about is the fact that maybe they are uh, too simple and that it's going to be difficult to learn a complicated distribution, a complicated transformation uh, uh, with those seemingly affine uh, layers. But if you combine them, you actually get um, functions that are very, very expressive. So here we have solved the first problem I was, I was mentioning, which is how to uh, sample and evaluate the push forward. So here we have this sample, uh, uh, this sample way of sampling the push forward, which is we sample from the base distribution and we transform by uh, the map T theta of the normalizing flow. And we have the uh, closed form formula for the push forward. Okay, so if I just flash back to this uh, reloaded uh, MCMC, uh, that is using normalizing flow proposals, we've solved the first point. Now, we still have those two uh, worries I was mentioning, are all states switchable, and how do we get a good acceptance? Well, we are going to tackle those two uh, problems by uh, doing two things. Uh, so combine the normalizing flow non-local moves, so the moves that are going to be proposed by the network, with more traditional MCMC local moves. And we are going to train the normalizing flow in order to have uh, a parameterization, I mean, uh, the push forward distribution that is parameterized by the normalizing flow as close as possible to uh, the target distribution um, that we are trying to obtain samples from. So it's going to be a simultaneous scheme where we are going to have local sampling, training, and no local sam sampling that are going to be done cyclically uh, uh, to provide better and better results. And uh, this is going to allow us uh, to train the normalizing flow. So let me walk you through the steps. So at first, uh, when we have local sampling, so we may have two modes, and we are going to simply visit those two modes, right? But those are data that are going to be that we are going to be able to use in order to train to start the training of the normalizing flow to have it resemble the target distribution. So we are using those data to uh, start the training of the normalizing flow that is going to, when sampled, start proposing data that um, uh, values of the random variable that are going to resemble those data. So we are going to have jumps that are driven by the normalizing flow in between the modes. And those are going to be useful to, in order to have better quality data that are going to be in term useful to have a better training of the normalizing flow and so on and so forth. So you have a virtuous circle that is, uh, if you want, coming into place. And uh, if I'm just a bit more precise about how the training is done, 
we are using uh, training by um, what would be a proxy of uh, maximum likelihood uh, for what KL divergence training, meaning that we are using the data obtained by the sampling and we uh, use this approximate likelihood because at first the data is not distributed according to the target distribution. So it's not an exact likelihood, but it's an approximation of the likelihoods. And we take gradient steps as uh, often done in, in machine learning, right? So, okay, if, if I put everything together, this is uh, what I get as an algorithm. So let me just walk you through the steps uh, just to crystallize everything I have introduced, uh, which is that we have steps. So in a loop, we have steps of non-local resampling that comes from sampling the base distribution, pushing it through the map uh, that we are uh, adapting and accepting or not uh, the new proposed uh, location according to the metropolis ASTM criteria. Also, uh, keep, I mean, keep on sampling by using also a local sampler. So for example, one could use Langevin Dynamics or Gaussian Random Box whichever thing that we know is going to give us some information about uh, local, locally about modes. And also in parallel, uh, when we have new data that is acquired along the chain, um, updates the map parameters uh, using those samples. So that's the, the concurrent training and sampling algorithm, uh, which, is, uh, which belong to the family of adaptive or nonlinear Monte Carlo because actually what you will realize is that uh, we have the fact, uh, it's, it's that we have the um, next transition, I mean, the transition kernel, so the next jumps are going to, uh, that we are proposing depend on the history of the chain. So this is why we are calling this an adaptive or nonlinear Monte Carlo. It's not uh, a transition kernel that is fixed throughout uh, the, the process. It's being updated uh, through uh, the sampling. Uh, it also uh, relates to other works that have proposed this com combination of uh, local and mode jumping uh, 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 sampling methods. And uh, another related uh, approach was Markov's core climbing that was motivated by variational inference, but that in the end has the same um, this same strategy of trying to model the target distribution and use it to propose new uh, new places to uh, to jump in in an MCMs. Okay, so that was a lot of, of theory. Let me show you examples uh, to convince you that this is actually working and this is actually pretty uh, efficient. And to start, as an example, I would use something uh, very simple, which is a mixture of Gaussian in two dimension. So here, what I'm showing you is a um, color, color contour plot of uh, the uh, density that we are trying to sample. So if we have a darker color, it means that there is more probability mass and a lighter color means that there is low probability mass. And here you can see that I have two modes with one of them that is actually twice as likely as the other one. So we have one of them that is darker than the other one. So now uh, let's assume that you would use only a local sampler like uh, Langevin Dynamics. And you initialize two walkers, one in each mode. So you are going to observe something like this where basically you are going to sample well each one of the modes, but you are never going to jump in between the modes, which means that you are never going to realize looking at your samples that one of the two modes was twice as likely as the other one. On the other hand, if you are using uh, the method we are introducing, and here on this plot, I'm going to again initialize two walkers, one in each mode, uh, and use so uh, the procedure that is going to collect the samples along the Markov chain to train the normalizing flow. And in blue, what I'm plotting is a color plot of the density of the normalizing flow. So you have this rho theta of x that at first doesn't know anything about the target distribution. So it's just 
uh, unimodal Gaussian at first, and it's going to be changed along the sampling uh, by those gradient step we are taking to maximize the likelihood. And again, we are going to use this blue distribution to propose non-local move. So if I launch the, the sampling training, this is what you are going to observe. The density of the normalizing flow is going to move towards the two modes as it's seeing the data generated by the local uh, uh, walkers at first. Uh, and so as the, the density of the normalizing flow is correlating with the target density, the jump that it's proposing are going to get more and more accepted. And you can see that the trajectory of the two walkers is going to jump in between the two modes very rapidly. And here you will realize that one of the two modes is more likely than the other. And if I just plot the final learned density of the normalizing flow, you can see that it's very correlated with the target. It knows about the relative statistical weights about the two modes. But there's a caveat. The caveat is that we need to have this careful initialization of having at least one walker within one of uh, within each basin uh, that is of interest because if not this is what's going to happen then you are going to learn only the mode uh, that you initialized workers in and uh, you are never going to be able to uh, have some mass that is going to cover the other mode and you will never jump and uh, you will think that you did great but actually you completely forgot about one part of the distribution. So it works great if you have a careful initialization, but be careful, there is no mode discovery. And discovering in a mode in high dimension can be arbitrarily hard. So let's say that it's an all another question that this method doesn't, uh, doesn't solve. Okay, so that's, that's the, the first demonstration. And maybe it's also uh, a good, moment for me to tell you why we didn't do something uh, else that may seem more um, obvious or more natural to do in the first place. So what we did in the learning is use this uh, maximum likelihood or uh, our forward KL divergence, which are equivalents, uh, to uh, get the push forward rho theta to become closer and closer to uh, the target distribution rho star. And okay, you can see that the forward KL di divergence is defined as follows. You have an expectation over the target distribution rho star of the log of the ratio of the densities. And if you just uh, rewrite it, you can see that it's equivalent to using the log likelihood with samples from uh, the target distribution rho star. And of course, you don't have at first uh, um, perfect samples of the target distribution rho star, but you have, if you want this rho t that corresponds to the instantaneous empirical distribution of the samples we are seeing, that a long time is going to resemble rho star. Okay, and so this is why we need to have this concurrent training in sampling. Now, why didn't we use uh, backward uh, KL divergence? which would be written instead of, so having the DKL of rho star and rho theta as the DKL between rho theta and rho star. Because in this case, it would be actually an expectation of a rho theta of X, so the push forward of the normalizing flow, which as I was mentioning at the beginning of the talk is uh, very easy to sample. So we could have uh, an, an empirical estimate of this uh, reverse scale divergence that would uh, be very easy to, to estimate. Um, and we would have another distance function that uh, at first really uh, closely resemble the one we have used. So if we do that, it means that when we are going to compute gradients, we are using samples from rho theta, right? So here I made an animation where I'm giving you again how the density is going to evolve for the normalizing flows that is proposing non-local jumps. And uh, with little stars, our typical 
points we are using to compute this DKL, so which is the uh, uh, objective of training. And what you're going to see is that so the, the data is within the, the targets that the normalizing flow is uh, modelizing, and it's never it's going to flow towards the closest mode. But the same as the data is only going to be within uh, this bulk, it's never going to see that there is another mode. And this is why we see we say that this uh, backward KL divergence is uh, very uh, prone to mode collapse. And you can even see that the way it's covering the mode is pretty bad, and all the mass is actually concentrating in the center of the mode, uh, which again is, is not a very desirable property. Of, of the model. So this is why uh, self what what I could call self learning because you would not need to use some samples uh, to do the learning some uh, sorry you would not need to have uh, some approximate sample of the target distribution to do the learning. You could just rely on samples themselves from the model which are easy to acquire uh, is actually failing and and not not desirable. This being said. If you had a unimodal distribution uh, and didn't care so much about the tails, that would be probably an easier solution uh, to use. And finally, uh, I should also remark that you could combine both objectives to try to benefit from uh, uh, both uh, types of advantages that they offer. So, okay, so far so good. I mean, I'm, I'm not getting any questions, but maybe people are also waiting for, for the end. Hopefully. Um, and what I wanted to uh, show you next is uh, examples of applications in uh, higher dimensions. So for now, I only showed you the two dimensional Gaussian. Uh, you would be entitled to being uh, a bit <laughs> disappointed by, by my uh, examples. So let me show you two, two applications. One uh, that is about um, an astrophysics uh, Bayesian sampling. Uh, application, and another one that is about uh, sampling fields in uh, statistical physics field theory. So about this first example that is about Bayesian inference, uh, the model is the following. So we have uh, a star exoplanet system that is orbiting around the center of mass, and what uh, we can uh, collect as information about this uh, system is the radial velocity along the orbits that we observe from, that we can measure from us. And what we expect from this radial velocity is that it will have a periodic behavior because of the, because of the, of the orbits uh, going on. And this gives us a, a model for the radial velocity uh, that has maybe a, an offset V0 and then an amplitude and then a period and then a phase. And of course, we don't have the full line of this orbital uh, uh, periodic velocity because uh, this is too expensive to get, right? You cannot have just one telescope that is going to look at uh, the same star uh, for days in a row. So what you have are observations that are uh, some values uh, that you know about this, uh, this velocity. So we are going to use those, this model of here only for now synthetic data. Uh, and try to see if we are able to infer the parameters of the radial velocity from the uh, observations. So we have again this, this model for the velocity parameters. Uh, and as I was mentioning, we have four parameters, the offset, the amplitude, the phase, and here I'm taking the logarithm of the period. And uh, we have uh, the observations. And uh, if we sample with uh, a, um, a rejection sampling algorithm uh, from uh, this paper of Price Whelan in the Astrophysics Journal, uh, also taking into account some prior uh, distribution on all these parameters, we are going to get, as an example, those uh, gray lines that are all possible models that generated those, those observations. So you can see. Uh, and, and those are, I mean, the algorithm is called the Joker, so it's Joker samples. And uh, you can see that you have around three different modes 
uh, to this posterior distribution, right? Because it might be something with this small period or something with this actual longer period or something indeed that resembled the model I was using to generate the observations. Okay, so um, the Joker samples uh, can be obtained, but they are quite costly because uh, they rely on having uh, on sampling the priors many, 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 many times, and then seeing if you got any combination that makes sense or not in the target density, target uh, posterior density. So instead, we could try to use uh, the methods we are introducing. And uh, this is what we get. So uh, in green, I have the Joker samples. And as I was saying, they are costly to obtain, but they also make an approximation that they are not going to compute samples about the posterior, the full posterior, and they are going to marginalize over two of its parameters. So two of these parameters are already collapsed on only one value and uh, are not going to have uh, the, the right, uh, the, the right distribute, well, yeah, the right, you are going to sample from it, but then collapse some part of the distribution uh, onto, onto the maximum likelihood value. And so you will not have the full uh, sampling of the posterior. So that's what you have in green. In blue, the blue samples are the ones that you get from uh, our, our uh, sampling methods with chain initialization that were taken from the Joker samples. So meaning that instead of maybe sampling 1 million times the priors and getting all those green samples, I only sampled 100 times the priors and I got those few points as initialization for, for the adaptive MCMC with the normalizing flow. And you can see that uh, the blue uh, uh, samples that we obtain corresponds to the exact posterior density that we can compute because here, it's, uh, it's only four dimensional. So if we ask and we are patient enough, our computer can give us the value, the exact value of the posterior. And, and indeed, if you look at the acceptance along training, which measures the, the quality of the training. So how much uh, you are going to accept every time that you propose a non-local move, you can see that you are reaching towards 60%. And probably if you were to continue sampling, you would get better and better and better, better acceptance. And in the end, you have fast mixing chains that are able to jump between modes. So that was one first uh, uh, convincing application. Now we can go even more high dimensional and, for example, consider those um, uh, statistical uh, fields uh, that are uh, useful in statistical mechanics to uh, compute phase transitions. And the example I took uh, is the FIFO model where we have a random field that is going to be so a continuous function from uh, zero one to uh, the reals. And that is will, that will obey an energy functional uh, that is going to be this uh, integral over those two terms. We have a local potential that is going everywhere on zero one to constrain the value of uh, the field to be more likely towards minus one or minus one. And we have uh, a coupling term that is going to uh, penalize to having large gradients uh, over the zero one to the field. So it's going to be to penalize the field to have high variations. I mean, uh, it will, or it will encourage the field to be smooth, we should say. And, um, and we have uh, also directly boundary conditions, pinning the field at zero at uh, uh, two sides of the interval which uh, adds up to observing configurations like, just like this one. So here I have four different, different samples. So each one of those lines corresponds of one realization of the field, which typically goes either through minus one or through one to link zero to zero. And, uh, and then you get so the, the target distribution that is given uh, by this uh, energy functional. And if you discretize the field uh, and say you take uh, n is equal to 100 for the discretization, meaning that you are going to actually be sampling a random variable in 100 dimension, you can observe uh, something like this, where the acceptance along the training is going to, again, start from zero when the normalizing flow doesn't know about the targets. None of the things that uh, are getting proposed 
uh, are going to be accepted. But as the normalizing flow adapts, you get an acceptance uh, of uh, roughly um, 60% towards the end, and uh, you get fast mixing, meaning that here, what I'm plotting are 10 consecutive samples of uh, the Markov chain of a single walker. And you can see that you are going to transition from one mode to the next very often. And within a mode, I mean, if, if uh, the, a jump, uh, a non-local jump was not accepted, then you are only seeing a local move. And you can see here, for example, that you have superimposed uh, samples, but you also have a lot of, of mixing uh, in between the modes and even between within the modes that is, um, that is um, uh, enabled by, uh, this, uh, by this, this normalizing flow. So um, I'm not sure how, how I'm doing on time because I'm, I think Cesar, you said that it should be around 45 minutes. So I have more to say about this example in terms of analyzing, analyzing it more in depth, but I also don't want to take, uh, I mean, the, the time that would be for questions. So I can go either way, let me know. Um, I, yes, yes, I was going to say, you, you can continue with the explanation, that's fine. I think we still have some time for 15 minutes. Okay, I will, I will, I will say something then. Okay. Um, so interestingly, what we also understood uh, with this, uh, with this uh, uh, plot, um, and uh, sorry, with this um, example, is that it's good to also take into account uh, when you are trying to go to those uh, higher dimension, what you know about the physical problem. So for example, when we first started uh, to uh, use the, the traditional normalizing flow parametrization that will use a standard Gaussian, uh, this is what we were observing along the, um, along the, the training. And those are samples that are obtained from the normalizing flow. So what we can see here is that uh, we are getting samples that are much more jiggery than what uh, the target uh, samples look like. And as a result, actually, they get uh, very little acceptance. So for example, here, the algorithm is not able to really recognize that both modes that are going through minus one and through plus one have equal weights. And uh, what you see is that some, a lot of uh, samples are, are just stuck in the bottom uh, mode. And this is because we don't get a lot of acceptance because the quality of uh, the samples is not good enough. On the other hand, if you put in the base distribution uh, a, a, a Gaussian that is not isotropic, but a Gaussian that is going to take into account the coupling term. This is still Gaussian, so this is still something we can easily sample with a computer. Then you get samples that directly recognize the jiggliness of the targets, and uh, you are going to be able to learn perfectly uh, the two modes, and, uh, well, perfectly. You are going to be able to learn uh, to, to a satisfactory degree the two modes, and that the two modes statistical weights are equal, um, because you have all this acceptance, and this is this, um, I was always saying, maybe 60% of the time you propose a non-local jump, you are going to accept it. So that's very powerful. And uh, this points, points to the fact that uh, we need to have those physics-informed uh, parametrization so as to leverage learning and take it to the, I mean, push it scaling further and further, uh, which I think is, is, is really good news and very exciting news uh, for the developments uh, that we are going to be able to see uh, in the future years. And okay, um, what else can I see? Yeah, so let me just jump to this. So for example, uh, think of, of, the, of uh, the application could be that you can uh, easily compute uh, free energy differences. So if you want to know really what is the relative statistical weight of the two modes, so here, uh, at first, it's just the same because you know that your distribution is symmetric. But 
imagine, imagine that you uh, are going to bias this field with a local field that I'm calling B. So this is going to either make the, either make the minus one or the plus one mode more uh, um, statistically more relevant than the other one. Well, if you have uh, such a, a, a network that is going to be able to sample efficiently from the two modes, you can write a very simple either important sampling uh, uh, um, schemes or collecting the, the samples from the Markov chains and uh, estimate the relative free energy or the relative statistical weight uh, of the two base basins. And here we are showing the good agreements between, so varying this value of B that is favoring, that is getting the, the two mode statistical weights to be uneven and uh, the adequation with the Laplace approximation um, of, of those uh, that predicts this, this difference between statistical weights. And uh, you can also, I mean, play further. And for example, you could be um, biasing in another way your target distribution uh, by fixing the average value of the field to be equal to something that is uh, away from minus one or one. So for example, here I, I took dot seven. And then what this means is that you are uh, going to have a, a, what we call a, a wall uh, in between within the, the configuration where you are going to have some of the spins, I mean, some of the location of the field that are more towards minus one and the other towards one, so, so that in, in average, it's around 0.7. And uh, what you can see is that uh, you are going to be able to indeed also train to this um, probably a bit more complex uh, uh, distribution, uh, the normalizing flow uh, to perfectly model uh, the two modes here. So you have a, a mode that is going to have the first locations that are towards minus one and the rest towards one, and the other mode where it's going to be the opposite in order to satisfy the constraint of, of 0.7. And you are also going to get some nice acceptance, also smaller here, it's around 10%, but uh, we are already in, in, in 100 dimensions. So you can see that if you are able to jump uh, from one mode to the other every 10 times, it's already something uh, really efficient. Uh, that you can engineer with with those with those methods, and uh, yeah, so that brings me <laughs> to my conclusion. Uh, that's precise. That just summarizes the fact that indeed, uh, combining learning with um, Monte Carlo, um, combining Monte Carlo with learning, I should say, uh, as I uh, has a high potential uh, of speed up uh, with regard to metastability. Um, and maybe uh, uh, an important point here is that blending knowledge with learning will be a, a, a key idea to push uh, those methods further because uh, here we uh, took into account, for example, the coupling term in a field, uh, uh, statistical field uh, uh, problem, but it could be that we have to uh, engineer maybe outcore uh, repulsions between molecules uh, in order to sample molecules. And those are all fascinating questions we need to, uh, to, tackle, uh, to tackle on. And, and so that's when uh, part of, of the future works um, towards application, but also within the methods, there are still a lot to do uh, to understand uh, further convergence guarantees of those adaptive MCMC, uh, which is also a new, uh, I would say, field within the MCMC community, um, as well as understanding, okay, uh, the usual, I would say, questions in deep learning of uh, understanding the role of architectures and maybe of different training criteria. Here we have uh, um, a tra training criteria in terms of this maximum likelihood. Um, are there some also transport-based uh, measures that would be uh, more appropriate and, and why? Uh, and there is also, I mean, questions of, of getting to more and more complicated uh, targets with maybe exploiting mixtures of model. So uh, many, many interesting questions um, ahead of us. And uh, with this, I will just to thank you for uh, your attention and I'm very happy to take questions. Um, thank you, Marudu, excellent talk. Um, you have any questions, just let me know and either here on the chat and I'll, I'll read them up for you if you don't want to say them. Um, I, I would have a question. Hi, Barbara. Yeah. Hello. 
Hi. Thank you very much for the beautiful talk and the beautiful work. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you um, if you could comment a bit um, about how for a, the method in particular in the applications to the examples um, compare to other non-local method, methods like parallel tampering or yes. I mean whatever you could have compared uh, to. Yeah, so that's that's an excellent question. So if you think of parallel tempering, it's a, it's a, it's a, I don't know if everybody knows about parallel tempering, but you are going to construct couple chains at different temperature, and you are going to have the higher temperature chains that are going to drive the transition in between modes. And uh, I would say that it's uh, it's different in the sense that you yeah you only need to have one chain, but I guess the burden that you had in parallel tempering of having multiple chains is going to be translated to the training of the network. Uh, so that's, that's um, I would take it this way. I would say that, okay, you have uh, those multi-dimensional, multi-model distribution, and you are going to have to pay some cost to try to, to jump. And it's going to be either having the parallel tempering with many uh, different workers and all the hyperparameters and all the tuning you need to do in order to make a parallel tempering efficient, that is going to be transferred uh, to uh, having the training of, of the neural nets uh, that, that, that works. Um, I think, uh, for example, in cases, if you were to take a mixture of Gaussian, parallel tempering would not be very efficient. Why? It's because it's not a double well. In the double well, even if you are high temperature, you will concentrate on either one of the two modes because you cannot move away forever. But with a mixture of Gaussian, you are actually having flat region when you are at high temperature. And so the walkers would just <laughs> walk wherever <laughs> and they would not be in a well. So that's one place where I know that something like this will more, be more indicated. But then um, I think it's, it really depends on the problem. Because then if you think of disordered systems where you don't have only two modes, uh, maybe or three modes or five modes that you can track but you have an exponential number of modes, then parallel tempering doesn't require you to know the modes in advance and to try and to keep track. And, and so I would say that this is a case where for now, this method would probably not compete with, with parallel tempering. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, you're saying that it doesn't require the same careful initialization that maybe your approach would require. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Barbara. Um, any other questions? Um, I can ask a question. Um, so in the um, so you presented normalizing flows, and you say that in um, in the future you want to uh, apply. If you can go back one one slide, please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe. That was yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, you have certain like, like um, a list of applications here, but were normalizing flows designed with one of these applications like more um, a, a specific of these ones in mind or just to solve what, any of these related problems? Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. The question is... If like, what was the inspiration um, do you have like an application in mind for going on to develop normalizing flows? Yeah, so I mean, the, the definitely, I think uh, uh, molecular dynamics simulations, which are, I mean, uh, an ultimate goal, but but can get arbitrarily complicated. And, and I think you will still, still need a lot of development in order to apply, but starting to go within this direction is typically the use case where you have you know, maybe two conformations, you know, and you want to understand how much, um, I mean, how, what's the relative statistical weight of the two conformation. So that's, that's typically the, the use case uh, that we would uh, love to be able to apply this method with. And yeah, and so this, this goes uh, through uh, looking at architectures and that's also a topic of development uh, through the entire machine learning community of having those physics inspired, um, architectures so that's definitely something we have in mind all right cool and um i was gonna ask you and to scale up to molecular dynamic simulations for example will it what will be the limitations like will, will it require a lot of memory or um, so 
the, the, here the, the main limitation, I would say, of application of these methods is uh, if that you need to be able to have a normalizing flow that is going to generate configurations that are convincing enough to be accepted in the Monte Carlo. So let's say that you want to um, create, uh, I mean, uh, propose a distribution uh, configuration of um, a molecule, but that you only generate configurations that um, have overlaps between atoms, even tiny, but those are things that are forgot that are forbidden by physics. You will just never accept them. So you need to have something that is um, precise enough, uh, and maybe it's it's going to go through uh, um, putting inside the architecture all this, I mean, as much previous knowledge as uh, that we have uh, in the learning, um, in the in the sorry, in the, enough knowledge that we have. Uh, in the architecture, in the setup of the problem, in order to have those that are realized, um, because otherwise it's uh, the I would say what what bottlenecks the possibility of having those precise enough uh, distribution is one uh, the power of expression of the parametrization we choose for the normalizing flow, and then it's the the number of sample I mean the time we are spending on training right because maybe. You will eventually get there after you've <laughs> you've iterated and 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 you know and tested all the schedule of learning rates that you can think of in order to converge exactly where you need to. Uh, and if that is going to take you as much time as running a, a molecular dynamic simulation that where you would see a jump <laughs> between the between the states, then maybe it's 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 not worth it. But uh, that's an open question. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Uh, so actually, I don't have a question, I just have a comment. So I found the talk super interesting. And uh, especially for us working on big data problems, I think that the way you are implementing that is um, also very smart. And I think I will, I will need to go deeper mm -hmm. in the models to see how we can benefit from that to speed up a few yeah. of the processes. You know, even every, even if you can have a like a, a, a small gain, but when then you start to scale up for big data problems, these start becoming great mm -hmm. contribution. So um, thanks a lot for for this for this work, and um, yeah, I think uh, we will definitely at least me I will definitely go deeper in the in the algorithms to see how to to use that in our yeah. Uh... Well, don't hesitate to reach back if uh, if you have more no, questions. No, thanks a lot. So, it, yeah. it has been very very inspiring. So for for some aspects that we usually don't treat so much, so it will be very interesting to to check more. Mm -hmm. Sure. So thanks again for for joining us. But before leaving, and Cesar, before we close, um, I will I will need to tell a couple of things about the call for papers that we have. Also, if um, you, Marilu, would be interested in that. Um, so let me, let me share that with everybody. So um, actually we have, uh, and I will type that in the chat box. So we have two, two call for papers. Uh, actually one is, a, is not properly a, a call for papers, more a call for, if you want conference paper or an abstract, so it's just to share your um, the work you are doing uh, with uh, with the community of um, computational scientists within the International Conference on Computational Science. Uh, as you know, ICCS is our top conference for computational scientists, and we have like um, we are organizing this year the fourth edition of the workshop on machine learning and data simulation for dynamical systems. So um, we are very welcome to join us. Uh, with uh, either an abstract uh, just to share uh, your work with the others or for a conference paper that will go on lecture notes in computer science. And also we have a um, call for journal papers, as we know that some institutions cannot have, um, cannot publish papers on uh, conference proceedings. So we have a call for journal papers um, in a special issue, machine learning and data science for dynamic system. The special issue is on uh, Physica A. 
So you can find um, information in the links I, I posted in the chat box. If you're interested in either one of these um, submissions, please keep in touch with uh, Cesar, Sibo, me, and Jake, and the others of the data learning group. And um, we will be ha happy to, to give you more information. So yeah, that's from me. And uh, thanks again, Marily, for, for that. For thanks that again for having me. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye. Yeah, I think we can. Yeah, we can close the session for today. Thank you, everyone, for Thank attending. You, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.